Thank you very much. I'm delighted to chair this panel on religion in the law and state. And um, my guests on this panel are Elham Mania, is an author and human rights campaigner from Yemen. She works at the Political Science Institute at the University of Zurich, specializing in Middle East studies. Her books include The Arab State and Women's Rights, The Trap of Authoritarian Governance, and Women Shari and Sharia Law, and the impact of legal pluralism in the UK. Gina Khan is co-spokesperson of One Law for All. She focuses on the rise of pro-jihadi ideologies within Muslim communities and the status of women in these communities. She was born in Birmingham to Pakistani Muslim parents. She first became an active human rights campaigner when she spoke out about her experience as a divorced lone parent. Imad Adin Habib is the founder of, of the Council of Ex-Muslims of Morocco, the first public atheist organization in a country with Islam as the state religion. He is also a co-spokesperson of the Council of Ex-Muslims in Britain. He has been threatened as an apostate for his beliefs and his activism, and the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain have declared May the 15th as International Imad Day to highlight his case. Nina Sankari is a Polish secular atheist and feminist activist, with whom I have had the pleasure of working together on campaigns to promote abortion rights in Ireland and Poland. She is an organizer of the yearly Atheist Days in Warsaw. She is vice president of the atheist Kazmierinski, hope got that right, a foundation in Poland. She also co-founded the International Association of Free Thought. Pragna Patel, is director of Southall Black Sisters, which campaigns for black and minority women facing gender violence. She also co-founded Women Against Fundamentalism. She has written extensively on race, gender, and religion, including citizenship, whose rights, faith in the state, and shrinking secular spaces. <laughs> Savine Vapur Tardy is a lecturer in psychology at the University of West London and a counselling psychologist for the Iranian Kurdish Women's Rights Organization. In this capacity, she has provided psychological therapy to women who have experienced honour-based violence, forced marriage, domestic violence, and female genital mutilation. So we will get the panel started. And I will um, just ask a few questions um, of the panelists, and then we will go to questions. Um, I'd like to start by defining the problem. On the face of it, accommodating religious sensitivities into the law can sound democratic. So how does it undermine the integrity of the law? I could ask questions of Pragna first and Gina to um, outline their views on that, and then we go to the rest of the panel. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, on the face of it, accommodating religious sensitivities in the law can sound democratic. My experience is that it is anything but democratic. Having worked on the issue of religious fundamentalism as it manifests in the UK and its impact on some of the most marginalized and abused women in our society, I have cause to worry about the increasing encroachment of religion in the law. There are two reasons why we cannot view this development as democratic. One is that we have to understand that the establishment and entrenchment of religion in the law, whether it's in the very fabric of the formal legal system or whether it's setting up bodies parallel to the legal system, the entrenchment and establishment of this development is a fundamentalist project. It is part and parcel of the way in which fundamentalists are envisioning law to make it compatible to the most regressive, the most fundamentalist and discriminatory interpretations of religion. 
If we look at the establishment, certainly of Sharia councils and Muslim arbitration tribunal in the UK, these, these um, bodies were established following the Rushdie affair in 1989, when space opened up as a result of state multicultural policies to give religion more space or a seat at the public table. But the people who grab that space were the most regressive, fundamentalist, or ultra-conservative forces. And they set up these bodies. So one of the things that we have to get better at doing is understanding who set up these bodies, for what purpose, and to what end, and who um, gets affected along the way. So for me, the problem is that the accommodation of religion in the law is a fundamentalist project. It is part of a fundamentalist vision that fundamentalists want to realize. The other problem is, is that the whole purpose of these, this project is to undermine the principles of democracy, democratic governance, and equality in human rights principles. And they do this by rejecting so-called Western secular laws. I should state right now and clearly and emphatically that there is nothing Western about human rights principles and the human rights vision. I want to cry when the idea of human rights is manipulated and hijacked by the religious right, by the state, and by the far right for their own agendas. Why? Because human rights have been fought for around the world. The ideas that the framework, the very framework of human rights, Gita Segel read out some of the ethos and values behind it this morning when she talked about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, were fought for by secularists, anti-imperialists, progressive feminists, and others around the world. And it is important that we see human rights not as Western, not even as British, which is how many people try to define what are, in fact, human rights. So we have to defend those human rights, which are under threat as a result of these parallel legal systems. I can talk more in a while, but what I would say is that seeing these parallel legal systems and seeing the law in operation in a way that makes them compatible with very regressive religious values has impacted the most on vulnerable women that I see on a daily basis. Women who need to exit from violence against them from forced marriage, from female genital mutilation, from marital captivity, from polygamy, from child abuse, from uh, honor-based violence, and so on. The list is endless. The harmful cultural practices and harmful practices against women, full stop. They are denied access at every step of the way by religionists operating within the law and within parallel legal systems. These are dangerous developments. They're there to subvert democratic governance and the rule of law. And they are arbitrary systems, discriminatory, profoundly patriarchal. And what they seek to do is inculcate women and those who, who dissent back into a very regressive religious value framework and to prevent and suppress dissent and freedom of expression freedom of movement, prevent the right to assert, the right to life, the right to education, the right to marry, the right to choice in marriage, and to exit from marriage, and so on. We have worked very hard in the UK to try and keep the law and religion separate. And let me tell you, it is becoming an uphill battle. At every turn, fundamentalists uh, making further and further inroads into the law. And they've used both education and family law in particular as a key site, as a key battleground. So it is no wonder 
that I think one of the most urgent struggles that are taking place in the UK today is a struggle between feminists and fundamentalists to seize, to, to seize these spaces, seize these spaces either to inculcate a more humane, a more compassionate, a more progressive human rights value as far as feminists are concerned. But it is an uphill battle. More recently, we've seen the attempts that some of us have made to challenge gen gender segregation in schools. Gender segregation is also being established as a norm. And if we're not careful, and if we do not remain vigilant, and if we do not challenge these encroachments, we will be party to a reordering of a social order based on very fundamentalist gender norms, a, a new order, a new legal order that will be profoundly patriarchal, profoundly misogynist, homo, homo, homophobic, sorry, homophobic, and anti-human rights. And so I think it, these spaces, these developments, are certainly anti-democratic uh, because they are antithetical to human rights and governance based on the rule of law. Thank you. Yeah. Gina. Um, I was raised in Birmingham at a time where nobody asked you whether you were Muslim or not. I never saw the hijab. And things dramatically changed over the last 10, 15 years. And one of the things that Pragna hit on was definitely what was happening, and um, Richard Dawkins did, Hawkins did, and Mr. Grayling did, and it was about keeping a religion away from schools, out of schools. And I absolutely go with that because of what I see in Birmingham. Just recently, I'll give an example of how <coughs> they use or infiltrate our institutions to implement their idea of Islam. Um, a couple of months ago, there was a council in Birmingham, and I read a post to his on Facebook saying, I have been down to this Catholic school and I have demanded that they change their school policies so that a four-year-old can wear a hijab. And I thought, what is he talking about? And then this gentleman was a councillor and also part of the cabinet of uh, equality, so he had a lot of power over women's organisations, schools, etc. You know, they'd given this man a lot of power, so he was going to use it. I put a tweet up. I didn't realise how powerful social media can be. And I put a tweet up saying, well, there's nothing in Islam that says a little four-year-old has to wear a hijab. This is just patriarchal control. This is what they're trying to do. They're trying to control us from the beginning at school, in British schools. So um, in the Birmingham Council meeting, he said it was just a storm in a teacup. The Brum leader accused people like me of being Islamophobia, and this is, you know, just anti-Muslim hatred sort of thing. Um, then Dame Casey stepped in. She was a lady who did the report for Cameron on what was going on in Birmingham with the Muslim community. She stepped in because it had a lot to do with, you know, are we, you know, this is similar to Trojan Horse where men in suits were, were trying to Islamize schools. And he was a counselor with a lot of power. The point I'm making, well, he stepped down. He stepped down, thank God. He lost his 40, 50,000 pound salary. He doesn't like me anymore, I don't really care. No, I don't care because I can be called, people like me are always, right from the beginning we've been called Islamophobic or, you know, you, 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 anti-Muslim hate when we speak up about these things. But there is nothing in Islam that says a four-year-old needs to wear hijab. This, it, it is abuse. It is um, a form of trying to control little girls to make them think that that's your identity, that's who you are and you're segregated right from the beginning, from primary school. That's happening in Britain today. You go down into Birmingham, I can only talk about Birmingham, and there's so many primary schools, and little girls are wearing hijabs in school, and they come on national TV, and the teachers will say, oh, they just take it off, and then they put it back on again. It's not forced. But the same girl in 10 years' time is going to say to you all, it's a choice, when it's never been a choice. 
because nobody has ever done anything about it. The fe Islamic feminists in Birmingham, they get so much funding, nobody has done anything about it. The point is that these people have the government of the ear, uh, sorry, the ear of the government, and they always have, right from the beginning, even organisations like MCB. I mean, there was a time we were just British Pakistanis, Hindus, Sikhs, well, Nobody asked you what your religion was, and suddenly we were just put into one box because the Muslim Council of Britain had the ear of the Labour government at the time and said, no, we're all Muslims. And we didn't realise that 10, 15 years ago about what was happening because they were all, you know, jihadism, Islamism was 10, 20, 30 years ahead of us before we realised what was happening when our identities were changed, when little girls had started to wear the hijab or women were suddenly wearing the veil. So... I don't see anything, uh, what I see actually is them using our democratic systems, our, our British values, has their values, simply to implement and Islamize British schools. British children are absolutely against religion in schools. I never thought I'd ever say that because I went to a, a Christian school myself but I didn't have any issues. My mother had no concerns about the school I went to. It was a totally different Britain than what it is today. Today, the same schools where you've got more Muslim children and then the teachers are Muslim, then the whole community is Muslim, your nurses and doctors are Muslim. These kids have never seen anybody, they've never met a Jew, they've never met a, or, you know, I don't know, a Christian or a Hindu, even a Hindu or a Sikh in these areas, because a lot of people have left. So, this poison that we're talking about of jihadism and Islamism, it starts with our children, and it's something I've been really concerned about, because, you know, if we really want to fight this ideology, we, we really need to start looking at the schools and, and what's going on with little children. I mean, we still have a problem with mosques where the imams are not even police checked. You know, we're, we're just left open to abuse. Nobody's really giving a damn about the little girl in a hijab. Does she want to wear it or not? I came from a family where we didn't even know what the hijab was. We were never told to wear anything. But had I been, and the headmaster had asked me, you know, Gina, do you want to wear a headscarf? Do you want to wear a hijab? I would have said no. But we're not asking children because the needs not, we, we don't seem to care about little girls. But the whole point is this, that this ideology that we all talk about, it starts with controlling us, Muslim women, Muslim children. It starts with controlling females. And it's starting with little girls in schools. And there are powerful men in suits doing it. I mean, I call it mullahism in Birmingham because that's where it, how it all starts. It's these powerful men who are saying, this is our religion, this is the way it goes, and you need to um, address this. MCB wrote a 70-page document on how Muslim children in this country should be treated. That is exceptionalism. So that's what's carried on. Everybody think, thinks little children, little Muslim girls, little Muslim boys, they're an exception, they're different, they're not like the rest of us. Well, actually, that's not true if you ask the children. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, to be religiously uh, sensitive does not require any special accommodation within the law because doing so we will be promoting uh, religious relativism. This means that undermining democracy and promoting prejudice and inequality. And I would like to uh, expand on this by um, uh, presenting just a case very briefly to show what this would look like. I work with a number of women who have been victims of honor-based violence, forced marriage, uh, female genital mutilation, and, uh, and a number of my clients, uh, who majority are Muslim, when it comes to divorcing, they have often seeked uh, uh, divorce through the Sharia courts. Uh, a number of these women have reported that when going there and explaining the forms of abuse that they have experienced, which include psychological, physical, financial, including sexual uh, forms of abuse, uh, more specifically rape, um, they had been um, uh, not advised, but they have been ordered to return back to their husbands because divorcing is um, um, shameful. It will bring uh, shame to the honor, uh, to the name, uh, to the honor of the family. And often in the middle of this, there are children as well. 
and uh, the ima uh, making the woman go back in these abusive relationships will mean taking the children back as well. So instead of safeguarding for the safety of children and protecting vulnerable women, women are encouraged to return back because in the name of uh, honor and um, often the phrase they use is haram for the children to grow up without a father. There have been other cases where even very recently of a woman who disclosed to an iman that she wanted to divorce her husband because her husband was sexually abusing her daughter. The imam said to her, you must not discuss this with anybody because it might, uh, uh, it might make it difficult for your daughter to later marry. Thankfully, this woman had already informed social services and this is very few of the cases. And I am talking about women who have experienced uh, a number of traumatic um, experiences, women who suffer from severe mental health uh, issues as a result of those traumatic experiences, and more and more and recently, the cases of uh, women uh, who are, they perform exorcism because, uh, uh, I'll be more specific, uh, uh, one of my clients had, been, uh, um, had escaped um, uh, her country because she was, uh, she was facing um, uh, a prison sentence because it was suspected that uh, she was having uh, an affair and she wasn't. Um, and she had also witnessed her sister um, to be killed in the name of honor. On her way to the UK, uh, she was repeatedly um, uh, gang raped for a period of time. This woman suffers from severe post-traumatic stress disorder. One of those symptoms is reliving the traumatic event. So she relieves that event of being raped. And for her to make sense of it, uh, she explains it as uh, being possessed by evil spirits. Her refuge worker took her to uh, a mosque uh, because the client requested it. The imam performed an exorcism, and when he, she told the imam what had happened, the imam told her, what happened to you was, uh, was not halal. And this happened uh, because you have left your husband. So in order um, for you to feel better, you must put this oil around your neck because uh, she was experiencing panic attacks and she couldn't breathe. So they, were saying, they told her that this is the evil spirits uh, um, that are possessing her body and are basically raping her because of what had happened. And she's, she's basically evil and that she, he prescribed her a, a number of um, times that she must pray and she must do it properly. She must not take medication. She must not seek therapy because taking the medication will make her go crazy. And these are very few of the cases and it goes on. I'm not gonna take more time. Thank you. Okay. Well, after that, I'll go to Nina. Uh, Poland is a perfect example of how religion undermines or maybe more destroys democracy. But before uh, speak about it, I would like to ask why should we consider religious sensitivities, accommodations of religious sensitivities at all, if not because religious, religious are granted, religions, sorry, are granted special status by our states and our societies. Do we ever discuss about other sensitivities, for example, aesthetical ones? No, it's just because religion is granted this right and we should not allow it. And I started uh, to speak about uh, example of Poland. I have uh, bad news. Last night, Poland uh, stopped to be a democratic uh, country. Our right national Catholic ruling party, law and justice, which is all but law and justice, voted uh, the last, last bill that destroys definitely at least, um, at least liberal democracy. There is a discussion about what democracy is in uh, our country, like in 
Hungary, for example, there is now question about illiberal democracy because laws are voted by majority. But if we are maybe not all, uh, we maybe not all agree on what democracy is, we know all what is freedom. Nobody wants to be enslaved. And our history, which is now nearly 30 years after the so-called democratic transition, shows how it could happen. It, it started with the very beginning of our democracy. It started with the fatal defect of democracy, with the alliance of throne and the altar, of state and church, through the right religious, Catholic, in this case, uh, parties. And the half of society, at the very beginning, like with the Islamic countries, it started with enslavement of women. One of the first bills were to limit women's rights, women's reproductive rights, right to abortion. And when the half of population is deprived of its right to uh, decide freely of her, the body and the fate, it is not a half of democracy, it is not a democracy at all. And it happened with the consent of all parties, right and left. Uh, all they were, re uh, were ready to pay this price. It was not too high invoice that uh, church issued. To its, uh, to its role in the uh, downfall of so-called communism. But we see now very well that, um, that it was now not about religion, it was about power. It was about authoritarian power and denying women's rights and enslavement of women was just the beginning of the enslavement of the, the entire society. So we faced from the very beginning changes in the law uh, which granted to the church very big power and under dictate of the church we had our, uh, our um, laws uh, change, including our constitution, when separation of church and state, when the status of, of neutral state was denied because our, bishop, our bishops objected that it is included in the constitution. In space of some years, the declarative uh, atheist state which was uh, the so-called communist state, changed into very real confessional state with obligation uh, to respect Christian values in uh, s the school, in the media, with the uh, comeback of uh, blasphemy law. It's not really blasphemy law, it's a bastard of the medieval bas blasphemy law called uh, uh, the offense of religious feelings. Again, what are feelings and how you can offend feelings. And many other laws that transformed our uh, state into the confessional state and it, the religion is always the instrument of control of society. It started with the women, but it finished with the entire society, with bills on, um, on manifestation, on gathering, which is very fundamental uh, democratic law, and with destroying the tripartite uh, sharing of powers. We are now without any legal defense in Poland. It's for now, I think. Okay. 
maybe Thank later you. on. Thank you. I'll just pick up where you left. Um, you see, democracy had its own seeds of destruction. We see that in Poland. We've seen that in Nazi Germany. We've seen it today in the United States with Trump trying to trump international uh, American institutions. And in a way, with majority rule, you could more or less also bring populist, fascist, totalitarian kind of regimes. By the same token, democracy has its own seeds of destruction. When it allows for too much tolerance for difference, I'm talking about difference, I'm not talking about diversity. Diversity is beautiful. You're brown, I'm brown, white, believe or don't believe. You are what you are, homosexual, straight, whatever. You are what you are in a diverse society. But when you start to allow space for difference on group rights, when you talk about groups, you're a Muslim, you're Christian, and you have rights, and these rights are attached to religious laws. Laws. We're talking about religious laws. And these religious laws infringe inherently on our rights as human beings. So democracy as a concept like this is not enough. You have to have checks and balances. And these should be based on ideas. Ideas of respect, of dignity, and human rights of a human being. And that should be secular. Secular. Because then you can protect all of us. You protect all of us, whether you believe or you're not. And we have a problem here in the United Kingdom. Because we didn't create diversity with all of this space for religious difference. We ended up with segregated societies and with fundamentalism playing on it. Because the issue, we're talking about Islamist groups when we talk about Sharia laws, who are the first, who were the first who started these Sharia councils, 1982, who created it. Muslim brotherhoods, Salafi groups, Diubandi, Jama'at al-Islamiyya, all are either fundamentalist groups or political Islam. But while this is the case, there is something different. Put, it, put these issues about Islamists. Very important, religion shouldn't be put in the public space. Mm. Uh, we have a problem in Switzerland right now where we hear groups who are in demanding we would like in the schools to have space for prayer. That's a public space. There is no space for religion there. Once we take that out, it's for, for the protection of all of us. And I'm saying here, not an, as an ex-Muslim, it's very important that I'm telling you here. I'm saying here uh, that as a secular citizen. Citizen. Let's talk as citizens. <laughs> well, um, I don't have a lot to add, but I'll just give an example for I'm from. In, Western Saharan population live in Algeria. And uh, both Western Saharans and Algerians, they both follow Sunni Maliki Islam. It's the same school, the same reading, the same Quran, the same theology. But still, a refugee comes. Sahrawi women have to go to Sharia courts in those camps, and they don't go to Algerian courts. And that shows it's all about control. You don't have to have a different religion or different sect to have religious conservative people, to have Islamists trying to control women and put Sharia courts. Um, no, no, even if Algerian courts themselves are based on Sharia, judges in Algerian courts, they have to study Sharia 
and they can judge, and the, the law, the penal code itself is heavily based on Sharia, but it's not enough. So always, uh, Islamists are always looking for more control. Uh, we shouldn't accommodate uh, religious you know, sensitivities into law because, as many of you said, um, in a state we are all citizens, and uh, being a citizen, we should have all a common law that protects all of us, no matter what our you know, background, religion, religious views are. And um, it's always the minorities, always the vulnerable people, always the uh, less articulate, the less educated people that are always, always a, a victim of, of, of those practices. As, as uh, uh, we see here, for example, here in the UK, we hear a lot about, for example, friends or secular countries, and people are quite, you know, very critical of a lot of countries where there is more of a secularization of the public space, of the family law, etc. But we often do not hear about countries where there is no um, civil family code. They speak about Lebanon or Israel, where people, or Egypt, for example, where there is no interfaith marriage, where unfortunately, not just the Islamists, but also the Coptic Church has taken the civil marriage all the way to the constitutional court to block it and the, the, to keep control of their, of their population. And um, so I think the um, conservative, ultra-conservative, um, politically religious movement, they always seek to keep control no matter what the religion is, whether it's Islam or Christianity, etc. Um, I'm just reminded um, that uh, about a week ago uh, I was at the UN and when Pakistan was up before the UN and um, the Human Rights Committee were talking about the tyranny of the majority, that democracy is not based on purely on the views of the majority. It is based on how majorities treat minorities in their country. So on that note, um, I'd like to ask the panel, um, what different strategies uh, do we need to defend the integrity of secular laws in democracies? and to promote it in theocracies. Um, I will start with Alan. Okay. Do you have a question? Oh, thank you. Uh, what strategies? Um, strategies. What, can we, what can we do to promote uh, uh, secularism in democracies, which it is getting attacked now, yeah. and what can we do in, uh, to promote it and to hold it up as an ideal based on human rights in theocracies? Oh. Um, one strategy is to show how this idea is for the, for the protection of all of us. It's as, as, as simple as that. But the way I do it when I write in Arabic, um, and I write on a regular bis basic, every week actually, a column in Arabic, I usually make sure to show how religion in Arab-speaking Middle Eastern and North African society is being used as an instrument. And in that, I agree with the speaker in the morning, uh, Ms. Amina. Uh, she was really uh, very clear about uh, how there are certain structures. So it's very important for us to see how these structures are working. When I worked for the book, Women, the Arab State and Women's um, Right, the Trap of Authoritarian uh, Governance, I went to several Middle Eastern countries with the idea religion is a problem. So religion is a problem. But then I came out of that research, of that field work, with a different approach. Yes, religion is a problem, but why is it still relevant? And once you, you frame the question in that way, you realize there's a political function for it. And once you see the political function of it, you will also realize who's benefited from it. So there's an article that I wrote about the political fun function of blasphemy laws in Iran and Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan. And here you see how 
political Islam, fundamentalist Islam, working together with the political elites. And they are trying to more or less mainstream a certain reading of religion in order to gain power. It's about power. So one strategy is to show the political function of it, is to show how it's, it's part of a certain kind of structure of systems. And another one is basically to show whatever, I'm talking again about the region where I come from. I come originally from Yemen. Is always to bring examples from other countries. My second country, I'm also Swiss, um, allowed women to vote in 1971, changed the family law, which was really horrible, 1988. And I always show how religion was used as well as a justification for that discrimination. So if they can change it, we can change it. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I think when it comes to theocracies, and I will speak about a few examples, when we have, for example, Algeria or Morocco, um, the majority of the population is Muslim by default. They don't really have the right to be something else. And when it comes to family law, for example, as we spoke about Sharia courts, when it comes to family law, e each interpretation of Islam, depending on the country, is applied on the citizens. With, even if they don't consent to, even if there are other forms of Muslims, etc., it's applied by default on them. And I think the best strategy to counter religious influence in, in laws in general is to consider people as citizens and uh, you know have no regard to their religious you know background or what their parents' religion is. And this way, you can have a truly civil, secular family law. Unfortunately, um, in many countries, there is a complete absence of, of, of civil uh, of civil law. So, for example, in in Morocco, if you're not a Muslim, there is no way you can marry somebody else. There is whether a the family called the Medouana, who is for Muslim citizen, or the Hebraic family code, which is for the, the Jewish minority. And if you none of those. There is no way you can do that. And also, we, uh, what happens is there, is there are few cases that are you know, increasing of religious uh, authorities refusing to marry people or refusing to divorce people, saying, oh, they're not Muslim, so I'm not accepting to marry them, which is basically put those citizens in a limbo because uh, being a citizen of that country, you have the right to marry, you have the right to divorce. But People have been refused, and the guys, oh, this guy, um, uh, for example, what happened uh, two years ago, that a guy had tattoos and had like metal t shirts, and, et cetera, and the religious sadhu refused to uh, give him marriage certificate. And the guys say, well, I don't think he is a Muslim, so I'm not going to marry, I'm, I'm not going to accept that marriage. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, with the coalition of One Law for All, which consists of Pragna and Ellen and um, Diane and Nami and Mariam, I'm sorry if I miss your name, but there's a group of us women, Muslim, Indian, Asian women, Iranian, Kurdish, and we've come together to fight Sharia um, courts, is what I'll use the word, Sharia courts in this country because it was a Sharia review which sort of passed the nation's mindset and a lot of people didn't realize it was going on. And we did a lot of work and a lot of research to put forward to the committee, etc. And one of the things I discovered was the rise of polygamy in Birmingham. And actually, I knew about it for 10 years. I was a, a victim myself, my, my older sister who passed away, she was too. And what I realized was it was just normal now, polygamy. You know, it was very much... Um, authorized by the mullahs, they had no problem. They're telling you to ignore secular law and they're just focusing on the nikah, the Muslim marriage, that's more important than anything else. So what we have now is hundreds of women who are not protected 
And then it's a vicious circle. So when they want a divorce, they have to go to a Sharia court. And I can tell you now it's just a business. They don't give a damn about Muslim women. I know that from my own experience. It is just a business. They earn between 200 and 400 pounds charging Muslim women for a piece of paper that is worth nothing. It's not even recognized in Pakistan or Morocco or any other country. It's not even recognized. But as Pragna was saying, it is. It's parallel laws parallel laws that have been implemented in the communities and people are believing oh this is Islam and they're all going to the mullahs and every single mosque has a Sharia court or room or whatever they want to call it where they all sit together and they charge women they don't charge men that's the inequality there for you right there and then they won't charge men for a divorce they only charge women because it's women going women whose husbands have that's one of the reasons I ended up there one of the, you know they take on another wife and you want out so it's a vicious circle. On the one hand, they won't stop this practice. They've promoted it by telling Muslim men it's your right. In fact, um, there was a very interesting um, conversation on radio once between Mariam Namasi and a mullah who was very ex um, respected from Oxford, and there was a panel. And Mariam, God bless her, she went on and she said, well, what about the men who can have four wives? And this imam who was pretty, this mullah was pretty calm before, suddenly he went into a frenzy. Are you going against the word of the Quran, he said? Are you going against the word of God? Well, you know, Mariam, she's really cool, and she went, yeah, it's against the law of this country. What about the women who are being abused? And Because the women who are being abused are legally married. These are legally married women, and their husbands are taking on second wives, and no one's doing anything about it. And this woman went into a little frenzy. He couldn't say anything else. He just thought, you know, here she comes again, <laughs> spouting anti-Muslim hate, which it wasn't. And I was surprised at how many Islamic feminists supported this mullah. Because suddenly someone put a tweet up and said, oh, Mariam Nazi is, you know, anti-Muslim, this is all hate. How can she talk about a mullah like this? And I turned around to this so-called Islamic feminist and said, well, how can you call yourself a feminist if you're going to support a mullah or these men who run Sharia councils? And they promote polygamy. How can you say you're a feminist when you're going to support the practice of mullahs when they're, when they're talking about polygamy or when they're talking about, um, um, name something else, the Sharia courts, basically. Child you know, marriage. Yeah, everything about this is your right, this is your duties as women. This is what they do, they discriminate against women. Okay. That's the bottom line. Take that. Well, you know, if we knew the answer to what's how to deal with this, as I suppose we'd be closer to dealing with it than we are. Nevertheless, there are spaces, there are strategies that we can adopt. I was very struck by what Nina said about we're left without a legal defense. I think one of the key sites for contestation has to be the law. In the UK, we're very lucky because we've got something called the Equality Act. And, and to be honest, I think it's the only thing that stands between us as minority women are in the front line of the threats that fundamentalism poses and fundamentalism, that what stands between us is the Equality Act. While we're lucky enough to still have it, we have to use it. Mm -hmm. So I am very interested in bringing legal challenges. It's about demanding state accountability. This isn't just about battling fundamentalism. I think we have to remember that this is also about demanding state accountability um, because the state colludes in all of this. The state is implicated in the way that it promotes these power brokers, these mediators, these gatekeepers, and allows them to construct um, faith communities or communities and allows them to frame demands coming from minorities. Uh, which never include the interests of the most marginalized. So it's really important to use the law while we still have it, while, while we're fortunate enough to still have it. But there's another important battle, and that isn't just at the level of uh, uh, the law. It's also about challenging austerity. Because what we are witness to around the world is a privatization of justice and the privatization of services. And who fills the vacuum when that space is created? It's not the progressive left. 
We can't assemble more than a few people together at any one time, this meeting accepted. But it is the fundamentalists and the regressive and the ultra-conservative forces who are able to fill the vacuum. So it is important to fight the austerity measures that allows privatization of justice, that allows these fundamentalists to get hold of the law and to get hold of and define what is justice. So we have to challenge austerity measures too, cha challenge the way in which the welfare state is in retreat because the vacuum that's created is part of that bigger picture of fighting fundamentalism. And thirdly, we need to make better coalitions. We need to form the coalitions, we, echoing something that was said earlier today, between different groups of marginalized and oppressed minorities who face injustices on a daily level. And it is only by coming together and forging a more progressive politics that I think we're going to win um, the wider battle against note, religious fundamentalism. On that note, um, can I do Short remark on regressive left, it's not just the speciality of Islamic, of uh, the position towards Islamic uh, Islam. The same we faced in Poland, and when the left dissociates the social and ideological, I mean, among other secularism, if the left dissociates it, it it fails because the populist right hijacked the social uh, claims and it's over. What happened in Poland, we don't have left. Now, strategies, I'm an activist. I will not speak about the big strategies, but I will speak about, about mobilizing uh, social uh, op protests and it could be done and it could, it can have an effect, we faced it in Poland, for example, with Black Monday, a very big protest of women. We, uh, uh, our organization, and I am personally member of the committee, let's say, for women. Or when women are mobilized for their vital interest and come in tens of thousands, to protest, it can stop, and what happened for some time, because they will be back, it's sure, but for some time, it can stop, uh, to, uh, stop the religious right to issue very, very uh, conservative laws. And also, uh, as um, I said, uh, it, it was said, I'm organizer, one of the organizers of Atheist Days, in Poland, and there we invite you cordially. I will distribute our leaflets. We gather there all the groups that could be our allies as discriminated uh, by religious motivation on basis of religion, like women, like LGBT, like many other groups that can uh, work with us. Savin, we'll just finish off on that and we'll go to questions. Um, one of the ways I think is to really bring home that human rights are universal rights. Mm -hmm. And um, this is regardless of an individual's gender, sexuality, uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and etc. One of the main issues that we are facing here in London is many women don't realize that they have rights, that they have human rights. They do not realize that what happens in the Sharia course is a violation of those rights. And I think we do need to tackle this because women's rights is a public matter, it's a public issue, and we must all defend it. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to uh, hand over to the floor for questions. So can you put your hands up? there. See you. I'm going to take three questions about together and then we can. 
Um, I'm Geeta Sehgal. I was on the panel earlier this morning, if you were in the morning as a chair. Um, I'm just speaking as um, the Center for Secular Space, which I've uh, founded uh, with uh, other people and also as part of the One Law for All campaign. Um, we have won some things, and I just wanted um, to ask some of the One Law for All campaign, Pragna, perhaps to address our victories because not everybody in the audience will know about them with the Law Society and with um, uh, on gender segregation. And uh, also to stress that, as you said, uh, Savin, that we do use the idea of universal human rights and in Britain, the equality duty. There are a lot of strategies which countries, uh, people in other countries have developed. For instance, to de demand a common civil code. I think people are fighting for it in Lebanon. They're fighting for it uh, in India, but it's a language that's been occupied by the religious right in India, so uh, some feminists are nervous of it, but there, is, there are struggles for common codes where there are these multiple codes that Imad was talking about. So actually people are adopting these strategies, and unfortunately they don't have enough support from human rights organizations for them. They all tend to be national struggles or sometimes international networks that are informal networks like ours. Okay, thank you. There's, I think there's somebody behind you there, and then we'll go over to this end, down the back over there then, and I'll, we'll answer those three questions. Pregnant, have you got that? that was yes, I've got that question. Directed to you. Okay, go. Uh, this question is mainly directed towards Nina, but I suppose anyone can answer it. Yeah. I think one of the forgotten tragedies of the Trump administration, though there are many, is this sort of refusal to protect liberal democracies abroad, whether it's uh, being unwilling to help fund South Korean defense or ignoring Russian imperialism in Eastern Europe. Uh, Trump has sort of abandoned that goal, which should be a nonpartisan thing. And I was wondering how uh, we as individuals can work to help uh, struggling democracies like in Poland or other countries when our governments aren't doing what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, have you got that? Just one more down the back there, over there. Okay. Hi, my name is Anders from the Danish Atheist Society. Uh, my issue is, is a very small one, perhaps, because it's about uh, polygamy being stated as a, as a problem that the patriarchy is forcing polygamy rules. Polygamy itself, I guess, is not really the problem. I mean, forced marriage or separate rules for each gender is the problem. Um, so is there any other way to phrase this criticism that, that polygamy rules are enforced? I don't know. Why is polygamy is not a problem? Polygamy is a big problem. Are you asking us? But I, I don't want to do my laundry here, but... Um, <laughs> Well, if two people are, I guess, mutually interested in each other, but allow each other to be with others, if one man wants to be with four women and his wife or other women get to be with four men in individually, that should not be a problem. Who is that? <laughs> Okay, okay, that's fine. We got your question, got your question. We'll start with the first question to Pragna. Um, okay, there's never enough time, so I didn't really talk about the victories. I, I mean, I, I think you're right, Gita. I think we shouldn't forget these victories because otherwise things appear too pessimistic and too bleak. Um, I guess, uh, together with One Law for All, we're serial litigators. <laughs> we also want to, uh, where fundamentalists are in action, we will try and find ways of countering them. Uh, political campaigning is one way, but choosing the law is another. And we do, we've used the Equality Act that I've referred to in the public sector equality duties. We've used these, we've invoked these um, to basically, if, you, if I put, to put it at its most crudest, to l contest in court whether the right to freedom of religion has limitations when it comes to the violations of other more fundamental rights and freedoms, including gender equality. So most of the cases that we brought at its heart is about that tension. 
does the right to manifest religion or the right to freedom of religion trump all other rights? And in, in our case, most of the time, gender, gender uh, women's rights. The first case that we brought a few years ago was against, um, well, it was settled actually, so I can't say that we took it all the way to court, but the threat of act legal action um, was a victory in its outcome, was against the Universities UK, which is a governing body of all universities, who tried to put out guidance, or did put out guidance, um, giving permission to external public speakers, and they were usually fundamentalist speakers, to be able to segregate public meetings on university campuses. And so the question of the Equality Act and the invoking the public sector duty there was about whether, uh, was, a, was the fact that this is a public body, the UUK body, and that it was violating uh, the equalities principles and duties as set out under the law. And that threat of legal action meant that the UUK guidance had to be withdrawn. The second, following hot on the heels of that, was the Law Society, no less. Now, you'd think this is a body that is invested in promoting a culture of human rights, but not so. In fact, what it was doing was promoting a culture of relativism. And what it did in, uh, in this case was put out guidance for all solicitors and uh, possibly others in the legal community to saying that in the drafting of wills in inheritance law, when drafting wills, bear in mind Sharia principles if, you're in if you have a Muslim uh, client in front of you. And Sharia principles state that um, women inherit half of men and that children born out of wedlock do not inherit, and so on. There are loads of, loads of very discriminatory principles that the law society, as a legal body, was promoting. So again, threat of legal action, again invoking the Equalities Act, public sector duty, even the Human Rights uh, Act, uh, forced the law society to withdraw that guidance. Um, and the third case is a case that we've just um, intervened in at the Court of Appeal. Our, um, the case just happened on July the 11th and 12th. And in this case, um, a school, a co-ed Muslim faith school, uh, sorry, a, a co-ed Muslim school, voluntary aided, was practicing gender segregation uh, at all levels for its pupils, particularly from, the, uh, from puberty onwards. At every, in every way, there was gender segregation imposed, including lunch times, break times, after school activities, uh, school trips, boys and girls were completely separated. And Ofsted inspected this school and found a series of leadership failings, including, and raised concerns about gender segregation. It also raised concerns about other things that it found, for example, in the school library, were very modern fundamentalist texts endorsing wife beating, marital rape, and so on. Um, and of course, Ofsted failed the school. That led the school to challenge Ofsted in court and obtain an injunction to stop Ofsted from publishing its report. Um, at, that, at the court hearing, um, uh, the school also challenged the um, Ofsted on the basis of religious bias. It lost on that ground, but it won on the ground that gender segregation did not mean sex discrimination. Because unlike racial segregation, this is what the judge said, unlike racial segregation, gender segregation does not have an institutional social history. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> We beg to differ because gender segregation is quickly amassing a history and it has a history in this country that goes back at least to the aftermath of the Rushdie affair and the way in which fundamentalism gained ascendancy in all religions. But of course Islamism is perhaps in the forefront and the most vocal. So, Southall Black Sisters, another organization in SPY, intervened because Ofsted then brought an appeal against that decision. And at the Court of Appeal, uh, a two-day hearing, we intervened 
to argue that gender segregation must always be considered in a contextualized way. It may, in certain contexts, for example, for educational reasons, be um, okay, be fine, particularly because the motive behind it is to bring girls up to, you know, to level the playing field and to empower girls. But in a context where fundamentalists are using education to disempower girls, gender segregation equals gender apartheid. And we're awaiting that judgment. We don't know what that judgment, we, we're cautiously optimistic that we will win. But if we do, we are concerned that the uh, school will probably take it to the Supreme Court. I'm actually very happy to see it go to the Supreme Court because I think we need to have good, sound, legal principles and precedents to help other struggles, not just in this country, but around the world. So watch this space. Um, I'm not sure that I get properly your question. Was it about how to uh, how individuals from European countries can support a Poland. struggle in Poland? Poland, Poland yes. Was is yes, it, it was yes, yes. Was. Okay. So as usually, uh, help can be moral, financial, material, or in know-how. In all those categories, we welcome any help. And um, I, I, as far as our organization is concerned, I, yeah. I can distribute these uh, leaflets you will see. Otherwise, I can give just uh, my address and then uh, invite you to And social uh, media, sharing, yes. sharing information on social media, you know, follow uh, um, it Polish is not so. It is not so easy media. because uh, usually it's in Polish. But yeah. we started also to make info in English. Yeah. It is worrying what's going on in Poland. Mm. It really is. If mm. you don't know about it, it, it is. It's oh, very yes. anxious about so it. So yes, please it follow information. Okay. 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 Um, yes. Um, I was once invited to um, um, a debate on BBC Arabic because there was um, uh, a Saudi um, man who wanted to establish um, an um, organization in Saudi Arabia to promote the marrying of a second wife. Okay? Uh, there was an uproar in Saudi Arabia by the women uh, themselves. And I still remember I told him if the law, whether religious or otherwise changes to one that tells me I have the right to have four husbands, just like he has four wives, I won't have a problem. But the problem is, is that we always phrase it with choice. It's like, I see that in Switzerland, I see that in here, I see that with my students. They always, there's always this assumption that if you can choose, where's the problem? But is there really a choice? We're talking about a hierarchy here. You have a structure where the husband is actually telling his wife, if you don't behave, I'll take a second one. How is that free sexual conduct? It's not about um, a consumption, because we are going with, with anything goes in that kind of uh, relationships. It's not about consumption. We're talking about patriarchal structures. We're talking about control. We're talking about humiliation. And unless you are brainwashed by a fundamentalist ideology, as we see it yeah. with many women who are actually defending that and marrying their own husband, wow. bringing a second wife, one realizes all the time they cry when he marry a second wife. Polygamy is domestic abuse. It doesn't abuse. matter how you want to color it up. It's being ignored. Polyg if you have an affair, it is still domestic abuse. You are abusing your family emotionally or whatever. So when you commit polygamy, it is, it is domestic abuse and it leads often, as it did with a lot of women I know and whose witness testimonies I have taken, including myself, it will always lead to domestic violence. 
Yes. And in all the cases that I have researched, it has always led to domestic violence. So, you know, you're probably talking about a man's prerogative. You're certainly not talking about the abuse. A woman will go through the depression, the sadness, you know, the, the almost having to share the, the husband. It's not funny. It's that joke I heard since I was a child. Oh, Muslim men can have four wives. Well, let, you, let me tell you, it's not funny because all I've seen is a lot of depressed, a, very, a lot of sad and heartbroken and families ripped apart. And it just seems to me there's an exceptionalism in Britain or in the West. Muslim men can do it. The rest of you would be looking at five years. Seven, more or less. <laughs> yeah. I think your question was why we don't call it something else, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's still polygamy. Polygamy is polygamy. We can't call it something else just because we want to divide it. It's like, for example, like alcohol, if you think about it. It's uh, in the hands of the person that drinks it, yeah? Alcohol is bad for you, but uh, you can misuse it or you um, can use it in other, you know, in other ways to enjoy yourself, for example. But when it comes to polygamy, it doesn't matter what label we put on it, it's still a polygamous relation. We can't give it another name just to say, okay, this is the part where um, the man has m got multiple wives and it's because of the Sharia laws um, that he's, he can go ahead and do that. So no, it's not distorted. No, it's, it's, the, it's the same. You can't call it something else. It's, it's still in the narrative. And um, regardless of whether the people actually consent or don't consent to this, it's still a polygamous uh, relationship. And, um, um, yeah, sorry, I just opened it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> oh, yeah. Gentleman here, and over there, yes, and then over here, and then over there, yes. Um, this is more just uh, something you said, LM, about diversity, and I'm going to bring this back to Canada and North America in general. I mean, they talk about diversity, but they only talk about diversity of skin color, not about diversity of thought. And like the way I look at my government right now, because I'm brown, okay, I'm impressed, and they're going to look at me and oh, you're diverse. But if I, as a minute I start speaking out and I don't say what their narrative is, I'm no longer oppressed. And the so-called liberals, they're, I call them benevolent bigots because they're friends to victimhood. They're not friends to victims. Mm. And as soon as I say I'm a victim, but I can stand up for myself and I want to speak for myself, they'll shun me. So there is no true diversity. So I don't know how you're going to fight that. Like that, you know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Okay. Question here. Anybody over this side? Hello. Who wants um, to take that? Yeah, hi. Um, my question is actually, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, the question is following um, Gina's um, initial talk. Um, in terms of British education and faith schools, so in terms of religion and education basically, the current climate, all our political parties are pro-faith schools and they also want to expand them. So, given the current situation, what would you say we can do to fight this? Thank you. I'll just wait, I'll get another question. Any more? Oh, over here. Hey, uh, my name's Danny Newman. This is my first conference and I'm enjoying it immensely. I'm um, just carrying on about uh, faith schools. I think there was a, a, well, there's been numerous polls done showing that the British public in general are completely against faith schools in the majority, um, sort of 70, 80%. So just carrying on from that gentleman, what on earth are our politicians playing at? If we don't want it, I, I don't know if they're just wanting the votes or, I, you know, what can we do to fight it? Okay, I'll take one more because that's, yeah, because there's two of those questions about faith schools. Hi, um, I'm speaking in the context of the United States. The use of the legal system um, using the Religious Freedom Act by the religious right. And the case that's happening right now is the FGM case in Detroit, uh, 
uh, where the federal government is persecuting the Dawoodi Bohra, the minority Shia group for FGM practices, which is illegal in the United States. And what's really shocking is a very famous uh, lawyer, Alan Dershowitz, has joined the defense team in support of FGM in the name of Religious Freedom Act. This is what's going on in America. It's just a heads up that I would like to share with everyone. Yeah. Yes. And um, I think what we've done is we've written to the prosecutors to say that FGM has nothing to do with Islam and must not be taken or be framed in the Freedom Relig Religious Freedom Act framing of this, uh, this case. Um, uh, I, I'm very happy that you actually mentioned Canada because it seems to be like hailed lately as a, as a very good example, despite the fact when, when you look closely you see problems uh, and issues are taking roots within, uh, on the ground. And that connects to what Annie just said uh, about this kind of like legal action in support of FGM. Um, I believe Canada in a way represents what I wrote in my book a woman and Sharia uh, law, uh, that paradigm embodies that paradigm, the essentialist paradigm, one that looks at us, brown, okay, <laughs> um, whatever, as groups, not as individuals, and as groups who are oppressed, and we are trying to protect these oppressors because we have this white man burdens. Whatever we've done before, we would like to. Uh, um, to more or less uh, amend today by our defense of these groups. But while they're doing that, they are actually, and using a cultural relativist approach, they are undermining the very core of the Declaration of Human Rights. The very core. <laughs> because when you stop treating me as an individual, individual, in a secular context, in a way that respect us all as equal before the law, but at the same time respect our dignity and ensure that the state will not leave the most vulnerable in society hostage to their groups, to their religions, to their ideologies, when we stop doing that, we are basically playing a game, a nice game. We're very happy, everybody is nice. We, uh, um, we are really good to each other, but we're violating the rights of these the most vulnerable in our society. We're leaving them. We're leaving them defendless. And from that perspective, the essentialist paradigm, from my perspective, is in Canada, and we see it in that case that Annie uh, just mentioned. It's about it. Let me challenge faith school, my favorite subject. Well, if everybody remembers the Trojan horse scandal that started off with a group of Islamists and listening to a whole bunch of mullahs who uh, decided that Muslim children were going to be Islamized and this is their way of life and it's got nothing to do with westernization and we don't care about secularism, these Muslim kids and it's their right and they're going to pray in school and they're going to fast and we're going to change the, the dates of the exam. There was a whole load of things, you, you know, they might just have their own little state in a particular part of Birmingham the way it was going. So we need to collectively, these are children we're talking about, these are our children. They're still children. You don't know how many of them are agnostic or the future atheist, but there are children and they're not being protected. And all we have is a, but, um, this is Islamism at work. This is Islamism infiltrating the education system so that they can Islamize children. It's as simple as that. You have to fight it because it's just been implemented in a way where they, you can't move from it because if you say something, you're gonna be called Islamophobic or you're gonna be called anti-Muslim, but that's not true. You know, children need that secular space in school to think. So we need to stand up collectively. This is not just, a lot of this is not just a Muslim problem anymore. You know, this isn't just about, there are things only Muslims can stand up for, maybe the interpretations and all the rest of it. But you know, the rest of this, we're, we're in the West. This is about all of us. This is about all of our children. These are the, these are the future. These, these children are the future. 
future politicians or MPs. And at the moment, it's pretty dire in Birmingham with the future councillors and MPs I see coming along, in the sense that there's a lot of Islamisation and everybody seems to be appeasing Mullahism. And that's got to stop. But, you know, they're starting in school, so we have to do something. We have to start fighting back and saying, look, we don't need religion in schools. Make schools a secular place as children can think out the box. If you're not going to allow them to think or not give them any space anywhere, it's just never going to happen. They're going to turn into adults because from that school they will go to college, colleges, which are already infiltrated. Then, we'll, then they'll go to universities. That's even worse. That's what's happening in Britain at the moment. So you need to, at least in their childhood, we need to fight for primary and junior schools at least so that children have you know, are safe and away and not impacted by, by religion. Do what you want to do at home, but give children that space where they can think and mix with other people and respect other religions and understand secularism. Just a very short remark. Uh, the question was about faith schools. And I would like to say that public schools can become faith schools as well. And what we are facing now in Poland is the case. We have more lessons of catechism, of religion, than of physics, biology, and, uh, and uh, chemistry together, all together. And we have now in curriculum no Mary Curie Skłodowska, she doesn't exist and even no Copernican revolution. So, pay attention to public schools too. Okay, That's great. I think we have time for one more question. One more. Should be a woman. They're waving down there, down this end. And a question, as we have so little time, a question please, not a statement. <laughs> Hi, I'm Terry Murray. I'm a blogger at Conatus News. Um, Eltham talked about democracy containing the seeds of destruction, but we've seen that really that's only a problem with a tyranny of the majority, whereas if we have a constitutional democracy and those constitutions uh, contain civil rights and so on, then we're, we're not getting into trouble. I think we need to go back and pull some of the threads together in the last session Benjamin David talked about the regressive left versus the liberal left. Um, where liberals emphasize reason, which is objective, the regressive left emphasize lived experience, because no one can argue with your, your feelings. If you talk about your lived experience, that's a, a debate ender. Where the liberals talk about universal human rights, the regressive left pushes relativism, which they describe as culture. Where the liberal left defends free speech, the regressive left defends censorship of offense. Sorry, I know I'm going on a little bit of a, this is not a question, but what I want to ask is, given all these differences between regressive so-called left politics and actual liberalism, how can we get back to defending real liberal values? secularism, the neutral state, individual liberty, the primacy, as Elam said, the primacy of the individual over group rights. Mm -hmm. We need to get back to that. Yes. Anybody want to take that? Anybody want to take that? Um, I'll just basically, so, uh, I'll just say, say something very quick here. So it's like, I, I think what you just mentioned, when we talk about the regressive left, uh, if we turn it into academic jargon, it's just like, it's a critique actually of what, would, what, would, what we could call a certain part of post-colonial kind of discourse. It's a paradigm of thinking that permeates our ways of thinking, our ways of doing, and the, and the academia. Uh, to, to, to an extent that we reach to a point where it's very difficult, actually, to, to insist that there, are, there is something called uh, harm that can be done um, because of religious laws, because of the experience and the values that are attached to a person kind of um, perception to values. But that's basically something we could discuss afterwards. Can I, yes, Can I just come back? I'm a little bit concerned about 
kind of very different labels attached to the left. I have to say that when you're not s struggling against fundamentalism or the state, you're struggling against the left itself. And it does leave you wondering who your allies are. Nevertheless, um, I think it's actually we can be a bit more straightforward than that. When the left ceases to be the left and starts embracing the right, it is no longer the left. Wonderful. And yes. I think that's what we need to remember. So for me, how do you get back to some kind of values I wish I knew? I know I stand for feminist, socialist, human rights, anti-racist values. At the moment, the only thing I can think of that we can invoke and mobilize around is the defense of human rights, universal human rights values. Yes. And the, the worry about that is that itself is under immense threat. Fundamentalists don't operate just at the domestic level, the community level, the state level. They're actually operating to dismantle the human rights framework itself. And interestingly, they may form in opposition to other fundamentalists, the Jewish against the fundamentalists, the Muslims against the Hindus, but actually they come together on key issues, particularly women's reproductive rights and women's rights and LBGT rights and so on. So they are forming coalitions to dismantle the very framework of human rights. So what we have to do most urgently is to continue invoking human rights values, continue staying true to human rights, the memory of those who put together a human rights framework to give us the freedoms that we enjoy, however much we're defending as well, at the same time. So for me, it's really important to fight that struggle, to engage in that struggle at multiple levels and to do what Karima said earlier, it's kind of multi-directional struggles that we face, which is on the one hand, defending all those who represent bigotry, hatred, prejudice. That means the far right, the racist, and the religious right, uh, and the misogynists, and the homophobics, and everybody else. So at the moment, the only framework I can think of, and it's not perfect, we need to improve it, we need to invest in it, we need to uh, invest it with very progressive values, is the human rights framework. But defend it, we must. Okay, one minute now. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the question I want to ask is the same question that has been asked, but has been answered. There's a, there's a hell of a lot of experience and in, uh, on the panel. The question is, when we have political parties that are supporting faith schools and gender segregation, how do we hold them to account when we can't offer them thousands of votes? As women, as campaigners, as activists, what the communities, the groups offer them are votes in terms, of a, in, in terms of a democratic system. When we can't offer them that, how do we get them to take on the issue about religion and gender segregation and the manifestations of religion? How, we, how do we get who to take on? Political parties. Political political parties. parties. Yeah. Um, With a minute. We Less than a minute <laughs> to answer that big question. I wish I knew, except that we have to bloody well hold them to account. Mm -hmm. It's the only way, and whether that's through legal, through legal challenges, through you know, campaigns, through um, parliamentary meetings, whatever, lobbying, whatever we need to do, what we have to do is try and hold them to account. I think state accountability is one of the most urgent things that we need to do at, at a number of levels. So for me, it's a question of, yes, they're going to be going after the votes. That's a lot of what this is about. It's okay. political power. But I think we need to name and shame them. Okay, that's it. And thank, I'd like to thank my panelists. I think it was a very lively debate, and um, I hope you enjoyed it. And we have David Silverman next, and I'm not introducing him, but... Yes, thank you, Jane, and the panel for that disciplined, sort of uh, well-timed uh, session. Um, now we'll introduce uh, um, David Silverman. Here we go.